I want you to take your Bibles and go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, please. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 3, I'm going to answer a question tonight. Are we living in the last days? Are we living in the last days? I'm starting a series tonight of messages on prophecy. I'm going to cover the thought, center around the thought of what's ahead. What is ahead? We look around at the world that we live in. We look around at problems, troubles, and trials. And ladies and gentlemen, the question that has been asked over and over again by the people of God, are we living in the last days? Are we living in that time where the end is about to be? I want to answer that tonight from the Word of God. Let's read, if we can, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God. Verse number 1, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. The Bible says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. I want you to underline that verse of Scripture. It's going to stand as our text verse tonight. And I want you to read it out loud with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Heavenly Father, I beg of you tonight, I plead the blood of Jesus over my heart, over my mind, over my life, that you would forgive me, O Father, of sin. Forgive me of the things in my heart that should not be there. Whether they be secret or whether they be known, I don't want to stand in this place as a dirty vessel. And I plead the blood of Jesus over my heart and soul. I am not a perfect man. But Father, tonight I want to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit and be a forgiven man. And so tonight I pray that you would empty me of me and fill me with thee. And I pray that you would use me to speak to the people of God. Will you help me tonight to say exactly what the Word of God says and nothing else? Father, give weight to the words that you would have me to speak and encourage the people of God tonight. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. You be seated tonight. As we write in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul the Apostle is writing to Timothy the understudy. It's interesting to me that people in our day are uh, concerned and interested in prophecy. There's all types of news articles. If you were to look uh, in the today's newspaper on the internet where most people today get their news, most of us, we get our news off of uh, uh, websites, Fox News, CNN. Some of us get it off of The Blaze. Some of us get it, uh, some of us are even now getting it off of Twitter. You get it off of Facebook. And it seems as if everywhere that you turn on the TV, everywhere you turn in the the newspaper, everywhere that you turn on the internet, every direction that you go in, somebody is talking about something that has to do with prophecy. I don't get on Facebook much anymore to look around. I'll post stuff for the people to be encouraged. And and by the way, can I just take a time out right quickly? If you're going to say something negative, don't let that be said about you on Facebook. Don't, Don't do all this drama stuff. Don't do all this drama mama Obama stuff. Nobody cares about it, number one. And you are to be a witness to the people of the people of God, to the people of the world. And so do like some of of the preachers that I know and take a vow, a covenant with God and say, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, as I get on that, it seems as if people are posting. You can't look through where somebody's not talking about the end of the world. They're not talking about the 666. They're not talking about the mark of the beast. And and everybody seems to have this appetite in the day in which we live. Are we living in the last days? You look on the newspaper. I've got some articles here that I'll have them put on the screen. And I want to show you some of these things just that I found yesterday. This was yesterday. This was off of the Huffington Post. Four fireballs that were spotted over the U.S. eastern seaboard. Fireballs. People cannot explain it. Just uh, mysterious balls of fire. There, there were some that appeared out in California. I believe there were eight or so that appeared all throughout our country plus these four. The next article that I, uh, I found just yesterday, it had to do with this. It had to do with the drought that is going on out west. 
people that are in the midst. We, we look and we've got plenty of food, plenty of water. They're calling for rain tomorrow. But out in California, our brothers and sisters out there in churches, they've not seen a substantial rain or downpour. Some people have said in the last three and a half to four years, the ground is so dry and cracked. As you can see a little bit in that picture, it's so parched that it literally is cracking down the bone. The next one that I found, it does not have to do with anything other than what everybody's talking about. Some of these viruses that are coming out of Africa. This one said that there's a strange new virus that could cross over airborne and could uh, attack America and could come and, and some people are talking about wars that are going to be fought. It's going to be fought biologically. And then the next one I found, I believe it was on, uh, uh, what was that on? I don't even know what that's on. Oh, uh, Al-Qaeda. Some of the terrorist organizations. Everybody in the news today is talking about ISIS and talking about how this, this uh, absolute out of his mind, demon possessed, full of the devil, straight out of hell man in Oklahoma that would behead somebody. And may I just say this, he was an Islamic man, he was a Muslim man, he was not a man of faith. I wish somebody would just stop and say, he was a Muslim, 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 bless God, he was a Muslim. I wish somebody would just say that. He was a Muslim. But he was demon possessed. You can't do these sorts of things without being demon. But everybody's looking at this. They, they look at this guy in Oklahoma. Then everybody's concerned about Al Qaeda. Everybody's concerned about ISIS. Everybody's concerned about all of this stuff. I believe I've got one on there. What's the next one, Brother Dale? I found just one more article. Uh, is that it? There was not one on Ebola? Well, there was one I found on Ebola yesterday that people are scared to death that it's going to be contracted into America. And we all look at all of these things and, and we have to ask ourselves the question, are we living in the last days? Now let me say this to the people of God just on the out front. I do not believe that we are living in the last days. I believe that we are living in the last seconds of the last minutes of the last days. If you're thinking about a time clock, I don't think that the hand is on 1150. I don't even think the hand is on 1159. I think that the hand is on 1159.9 and at any moment the Lord Jesus could split the eastern sky and come and get His church home. I'm going to prove that to you though from the Word of God. But let me clarify something right quickly because I think that Hollywood has done a severe, and I know it's done a severe injustice, but I believe it's done major damage to the people of God. What do I mean when I'm referring to the last days. Some of us, when I say the last days, you get pictures in your minds of movies where the earth begins to crack open and where uh, cities fall in and where airplanes bust each other and, and fly into each other and, and all of this stuff. You get the idea of your house just exploding because gas lines go up. When the Bible talks about the last days, this is what it is invariably referring to. It is talking about that moment, that second those days that precede the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not talking about the days when the earth explodes and goes into me. Those last days, it is the reference that it talks about the seconds and the minutes that are preceding the coming of the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. And let me answer a question here for the people that are wondering. You say, preacher, I'm so scared. Child of God, you have no need to be afraid. You have nothing to be afraid of. Our Father still owns the camels and the cattle and the camels and the diamonds and the horses and everything that's on those thousand hills. He owns the rubies and the diamonds inside of those thousand. You don't have a thing to worry about, child of God. My Father owns it all and everything is His. And if I'm His, I'm safe in His keeping. But ladies and gentlemen, let me give you this. As the Apostle Pete, uh, uh, Paul is writing, he writes to Timothy, and the book of 2 Timothy is easily understood when you have this five-point outline. Let me give you this outline, very this four-point outline. Let me give you this to you. It can be broke down by chapters. In chapter 2, we read the story of a forgiven apostle. He says, this, he, he says, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him unto that day. Then chapter number 2, we, it tells the story of a fighting associate. He says in chapter 2, verse number 1, He says, thou, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. So in chapter 1, it's a forgiven apostle. Chapter 2, we have a fighting associate. In chapter number 3, what we're going to be looking at tonight, he tells about the finishing age. He talks about those minutes, those hours, those seconds, those days before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 4, he tells us about a farewell address. 
Chapter 1, a forgiven apostle. Chapter 2, a fighting associate. Chapter number 3, a finishing age. Chapter 4, a farewell address. You get those things down, you'll fairly much and have in good mind the the book of 2 Timothy. Chapter number 3, though, tells us about the last days. You say, preacher, what's it going to be like in the last days? Are we living in the last days? Well, this is going to tell us whether or not we're living in the last days. And I'm not going to tell you what I think. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says, and I'm just going to let you make up your own mind. Ladies and gentlemen, there's three points I want to give you tonight. I want you to write them down. And you answer the question at the end of the hour or at the end of two hours or three hours, however the Holy Ghost moves. Whoops, say amen right there. Just however it goes, and we'll see whether or not we're living in the last days. Number one, let me tell you about the certainty of the last days. The Bible says in chapter 3, verse number 1, this no. See that word no? Underline that word no. This no also that in the last days, perilous times, what's that next phrase? Shall come. Ladies and gentlemen, it's interesting to me that Paul here uses two phrases of certainty that we have. He said, I want you to know this, and you know that it shall come. Ladies and gentlemen, over and over and over in the Bible, God talks about the last days, the end times. Twelve different times, I believe it is, that I have marked in my Bible. Ten different times I've got marked in my Bible where the phrase last days or end times are used in the context of what we're talking about. Ten different times. Well, you say, preacher, what is ten? Ten is the number of God's regiment, God's law. It is as set as if God is already ending things. That is how certain the end of times are. You know, there's something in the Scripture that declares that Jesus is coming back again that this world's not our home that we're just passing through. There is something in the Word of God that just says over and over, the last days, the end times, the last days, the end times. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in the last days. How do I know that? Because we do know that we have more behind us than we do in front of us. How do I know that? Because there's 2,000 years behind us and we're not promised tomorrow. So we know we have more behind us than we've got in front of us. We know we're living in the last days. What's interesting to me though also, not only does the Scripture declare it, but also our conscience declares it. You know there's something that burns inside of every man, woman, boy, and girl... I don't care what they say. I don't care how they act. You go to college somewhere, you may have people that say that they're atheists. I do not truly believe in my heart that any man, woman, boy, or girl can be a true atheist. I believe they can be agnostic and say, I don't know. But if they're going to be honest, they have to say, they cannot say, I know there is not a God because it is written in the very fiber, on the very conscience, according to Romans 1 and 2, of every man, woman, boy, and girl, there is something that burns inside of us. It also burns inside of us to say this, that we know that this cannot go on forever. There is something inside of you that is built in. It's called a time clock. Every one of us, we're thinking about the day of our death. None of us sit here and think, well, I'm just going to live forever. I'll just keep going. Every one of us have that programmed inside of us that we know that the end is on its way. And even the Bible says that the creation groans for the day when Jesus Christ makes all things new again. And Inside of every man, woman, boy, and girl, inside of you tonight, you may not have thought about it, you may not have voiced it, but inside of your spirit, there is something that is telling you this will not and cannot go on forever. There has to be an end and there has to be something else. It's burned inside. The Bible says that eternity is burned inside of the heart of every man. So we know that there is a certainty to the last days. Let me give you number two. You say, preacher, what is the second point? I'm glad you asked. Number two, let me give you the climate of the last days. Now I want you to get out your pen and your paper and hold on. Because there's some things that I want to show you here that I believe God convinced in me from the Bible that we are living in the last days. In chapter number three, write this down. There is a climate that is given. In chapter three, verse two through verse nine, it talks about the moral climate. In chapter number, uh, in chapter three, verse number twelve and thirteen, it talks about the spiritual climate. Now, you say, preacher, what will the nation be like whenever God returns, whenever the Lord Jesus comes back? What will it be like in the last days? Chapter three, verse two down through verse number nine tells us 
what it's going to be like. And I'm just going to read these to you, and I'm just going to give them to you, and I, you just tell me with the nodding of your head if it sounds like anybody around you or the day in which you live. In chapter 3, verse number 2, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That means that they're selfish. Anybody want to nod at me this evening? Then it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. You know what that means? It means they love money. Okay? It says they are boasters. You know what it means to boast? I, I looked that word up. It literally means to be an empty pretender. It means to act like you have something that you do not have. Nobody knows this better than a business owner. When you get employees that come and work for you, they act like they got it made in the shade and they got everything you need. But they're empty pretenders, aren't they? Anybody know anybody like that? Alright. Are we on the track with anything tonight? Then it says covetous. It says they're boasters. It says they're proud. You know what that means? Proud. It means to show yourself above everybody else. Anybody know any arrogant people? Anybody want to chalk it up and say sometimes I'm guilty of it as well? Yeah. For one of us. He says that they're blasphemers. That means that they speak evil of God. We live in a day and an hour where there is nothing sacred or holy anymore. You can remember, some of you old timers can remember a day when the church, you could leave the church unlocked, the windows open, and nobody would touch a thing inside. Now you can't buy an alarm system good enough. You can't have cameras sharp enough. You can't have padlocks deep enough that will keep hoodlums and punks and lowlifes out of the house of God when they're not supposed to be here. Anybody know anybody like that? Blasphemers? It says this, they're disobedient to parents. Disobedient to parents. Some of you moms and dads in here with tears in your eyes have to say, I don't know what happened to my babies. I don't know what happened to my children. I woke up one day and it seemed as if hell had settled in on their spirit. wonder if we're living in the last days. I don't think I've seen one yet that it does not overly apply. He says that they're disobedient to parents. Unthankful. It means ungrateful. Some of you grandmas and grandpas have worked so hard for those grandchildren, labored so hard for those kids, and they won't even give you a holy hallelujah or a thank you. Unthankful. It says then that they're unholy. You know what that means? It means they're pagan, they're heathens. It's amazing to me the people that come into the house of God last night live like the devil. It doesn't bother me that they're here. It bothers me that they don't care. They're unholy. Look at what it says in verse number 3. Without natural affections... You say, preacher, what does that mean? Some preachers have taken that to mean uh, like a homosexuality, lesbianism. That, that's not what that means. Without natural affection. What that literally means, it means to not have the proper amount of affection for somebody. For instance, it's a mother that would birth a baby and throw it in the toilet. It's a daughter that would murder her mother because her boyfriend told her to without natural affection. It's a wife a husband that would shoot their spouse in the middle of the night there without natural affection. That's natural. That's birthed in for a mother to love their child, a child to love their mother. That is something that we're given from our very inception and conception. But it says in the last days they'll be without. We've got some police officers, sheriff's deputies, and highway patrolmen that come to our church that I know. They'll be the first one to tell you that we're living in that day. More crimes of passion, more crimes of, of problems and domestic disputes happen in our day. And that, anybody know anything about that? Yeah. It says then in verse number 3, there'll be truce breakers. You know what that means? It means you can't get them to keep a covenant. You can't get them to keep a contract. The lady that we bought our house from, I almost felt sorry in buying the house from her. We, uh, God blessed us in getting that house, but it was because that she entered into a contract with somebody else, a family member. Took out a second mortgage on her home, and that family member left her holding the bag. Used to be you could shake a hand. Now you can't even clad them in with their social security number and their signature. Contracts mean nothing. 
Are we living in the last days? Well, it says that they shall be uh, false accusers, incontinent. That means they lack self-control. It says that they'll be fierce. That, that means they're savage. That means you go into a workplace and you just butcher a lady and cut her head off. You're savage. That's what animals do. But you know, I really, I, I'm not shocked. Our public school system has told our kids that they're nothing more than a glorified ape or monkey. What do they expect when they start acting like an ape or a monkey? Ladies and gentlemen, you are not an ape or a monkey. Young people, you listen to this preacher, you listen to him. I don't care what any brain dead teacher tells you. You're made in the image of an almighty God. You're made in the image of God the Father. You have free will. You matter and mean something to the God of heaven. You're not some monkey tadpole or puddle of ooze, ladies and gentlemen. You are a child of God made in His image. I'm glad and thank God. I'm glad to. No, I am a somebody. I'm made in the image of God. And I was worth Calvary. I am a somebody. He says that not only will they be uh, fierce, they'll be despisers of those that are good. My wife was riding home today. Last night, uh, we had to, uh, to make the journey up to Kernersville. And uh, if you're wondering why I'm in the flesh tonight, I had to see my in-laws last night. Y'all pray for me that God will help me and, and salvage my spirit. But anyways, last night I went and saw my, uh, my, my children and gone up there and spent the day with my, my wife's parents and, and went up there. And, and we went to Ham's. All the Ham's down here in town have shut down. The rest of them are just a bunch of bars. So we went up there. They got good food. We walked in. And I noticed there were four or five police cars. I said, well, Lord God, Erica doesn't call the police on me. I ain't doing anything. I I, don't, I just showed up, go pay for a meal. We got inside and her grandparents said, you see all those police cars out there? You see all those police cars out there? I said, yeah. They said, you know what that was? I said, what? They said a man had his son, a little boy, and a little boy acted up, pitched a fit, laid down the floor and pitched a fit, so the daddy just popped him on the rear end and somebody called the police. Now watch me. Now watch me. I'm against child abuse. I think if you abuse a child, you ought to be beat by every prisoner on this side of the Mississippi. That's my opinion, all right? You can chalk that down, whatever you want. Here's my question. We consider that child abuse, but a mother and father will get drunk right in front of their children. And it's okay to put children inside of a homosexual home. It's okay to get drunk in front of them, and, and it, it's okay to tell them to go sit in a corner. It's okay to do all that stuff. But just a little godly discipline. You know what they are? They're despisers of that which is good. They hate it. Is it any wonder to you that you can stay faithful to your spouse? Ma'am, you can stay faithful to your husband. And the women at your office tell you, you just leave him. And you're looked down on because you don't hop from bed to bed to bed to bed. You know why? They're despisers of that which is good. Are you living in the last days? Looks to me like we're getting pretty close. Then he says this, they shall be traitors. They shall be heady, that means they're reckless. They shall be high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Wow. Having the form, the shape of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He goes down through chapter 3, verse number 9, and here's what he gives. He gives 21 indictments against the last generation. He gives 21 indictments of that last time. He said there's 21 things that are going to define that last generation. Now, here's what's interesting to me. I got to studying this and my mind got so overwhelmed, conviction settled in on my heart, so heavy and so deep. Not only does it give 21, do you know what 21 is the number of in the Bible? 21 in the Bible is the number of the exceeding sinfulness of man and sin. Watch this. In the Old Testament, Israel had 21 major rebellions. And that's when God sent judgment. After their 21 major rebellions against God, that's when He sent the judgment. In the book of uh, Obadiah, Obadiah, it tells us about the destruction of Edom for their pride and violence. You know how many verses are in Obadiah? 21. Do you know what the 21st book in the Bible is? It's Ecclesiastes. You know what the theme of Ecclesiastes is? The vanity and the emptiness of sin. Anytime the number 21 shows up, judgment is soon to follow. Let me blow your mind on this. The last king of Israel, of Judah, was a man by the name of Zedekiah. 
Zedekiah came to power and immediately within the years that he came to power, Nebuchadnezzar came in and judged the people of God. You know how old Zedekiah was when he started to reign? 21. Anytime 21 is mentioned in the Word of God, judgment is soon to follow. And so here when we read that there are 21 indictments against the culture in the last days, ladies and gentlemen, you better hold on because judgment is about to fall on a people that are guilty of these. Now watch this. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I was sitting here studying this and He said, Son, write out, the Uni- write out United States of America. You know how many letters are in United States of America? 21. 21. Is it any wonder to you why the most powerful, influential nation on the planet is on a slippery slope downward? And it seems as if there's nothing that we can do. I heard a pastor say yesterday, and I I, I hate to say this, but I, I have to agree with it. He said the days of mass evangelism, the days of mass crusades in our nation are over. People don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to hear on a mass level the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus. You say, preacher, what's going to happen to America? I'll preach a message on that in a few weeks. But I do believe that I'm beginning to see that America is being used by the exceeding sinfulness of sin to usher into the world the plague and the judgment that comes from sin. You look at it. What is the biggest consumer of pornography in the world? United States of America. They say it's a some seven billion dollar industry in America every year. You look at the biggest consumer of alcohol in all the world. It's America. You look at the biggest, uh, the highest divorce rate in all of the world. It falls in our land. It's as if the devil has set up shop on America. United States of America. Twenty one letters. Judgment is soon to come. You say, well, hallelujah, preacher, I'm glad I came on this Sunday night. You sure have encouraged me in the faith. Thank you for helping me walk with Jesus. I got a third point. Hold on, children. I got a third point. You say, preacher, are we living in the last days? I believe we are living in the last seconds of the last days. You say, preacher, is there any hope? May I give to you my third point? My third point has nothing to do, has nothing to do with the certainty of the last days. It has nothing to do with the climate of the last days, but it has everything to do with our confidence in the last days. You say, preacher, is there any hope? Preacher, is there anything that I can do? Child of God, you remember one thing if you don't remember anything else, that your God He is your Father and He is the God over this world and eternity. He holds the cattle and He holds the reins and He told the sun to come up this morning and if there is hope in the sun coming up tomorrow when the sun raises up in the morning new mercies will flow with it because great is Thy faithfulness O God my Father. Morning by morning new mercies I see. We have a Father. Ladies and gentlemen, we have hope. In these last days, preacher, are we living in the last days? We are living in the last days. I fear that we're actually living in the last days of our nation. But you don't whimper and you don't shy away and you don't get discouraged and you don't hang your head low. I'm telling you, we have hope. We have a confidence. You say, preacher, what is our confidence in these last days? Are you ready? I'm going to give them to you and go to CC. Say amen right there. Number one, what is our confidence, preacher? Number one, the fact the Lord has not abandoned us. The Lord has not abandoned us. Will you look with me in verse number 11? Paul said, Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Watch this little phrase. But out of them all, not out of some of them, not out of a few of them, not out of just a handful of them, 
He said, but out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. Paul believed in his day that he was living in the last day. He believed in his time that he was in living in the last time. His head was about to be laid down on the chopping block there to be offered at the hands of Nero's henchmen. But ladies and gentlemen, Paul looked back over his life. He said, Timothy, son, I want you to remember one thing. I was in a deep place. I was out on the sea. Second Corinthians tells us this. He was out on the sea, wandering in the midst of the sea. He was out in a dark place. Hey, but the Lord delivered him. He was in a prison, but the Lord delivered him. He was on the, uh, he was on the auction block, but God delivered him. He was in the miry pit of sin, but God delivered him. And he wanted Timothy to remember one thing. He said, son, when you feel like you get down to your wit's end, and you you feel like you're all done and the world has abandoned you and Demas has forsaken you and Luke's nowhere to be found. He said, remember one thing, you still have a God in heaven. You still got a Father on the other side and though man may turn their back, your Father will never turn His back on you. He said, all of them all, God delivered me. You say, preacher, I'm so afraid of what's going to come in these last days. You don't have to worry about it, child of God. You don't have to fret over people of God. You don't have to be afraid, son of God. You don't have to be afraid, daughter of God. Your father has not lost a battle yet. He's been in a whole lot of scuffles and he's been in a whole lot of fights. You ask old Sennacherib in the Old Testament what it's like to fight against the good host of heaven. You ask old Lucifer what it's like to fight against the good host of heaven. You ask Old Pharaoh and his chariots what it's like to fight against the good God of heaven and every one of them will have to say to you I'm not going to tell you you can take him but if you want to stand up against him certain death will be your doom because you can't beat a God that big you can't beat a God that bad you can't beat a God that high you can't beat a God that goes that wide you can't beat a God that goes down that deep you say preacher I'm ascending up high he said lo I am with you you say I'm going down to the belly of hell. Hey, he said, I am with you. He said, I'm going out as far as the east is from the west. I'm telling you, child of God, you can't go too far out. You can't get up too high. You can't go down too low where God's love and grace will not find you and bind you and keep you. Thank God the Lord has delivered me and He has not abandoned me. Not anywhere I go. You say, preacher, I can't take it. The Lord will not abandon you. You say, how do you know that? Are you ready? You cost Him too much for Him to lose you or lose track of you. At my house, I've got a few things. One thing I've got, I have got a watch that somebody gave me. A beautiful watch. Wonderful watch. And that watch is precious to me. And it costs something. And listen, I may forget my wife and leave her at home. I may pull out and forget to put the car seat back in her car. I may pull out and forget to leave her money. I may pull out and forget to put the right color socks on my feet. I may forget to put my belt on. I may forget my Bible to come to church. I may even forget my kids at a restaurant. But I'm going to tell you something. I ain't going to forget that watch. It ain't going to happen. I thought I lost it one time and we moved heaven and earth to find it. Now you're laughing at me right now, but some of you got some stuff, so help me God, if you thought you'd misplaced it, you turned the kids over, you turned your husband and your wife over, you turned the house over just to find it. Why? Because it's precious to you. It means something to you. And some of you, if your kids went missing, you'd move heaven, earth, hell, and heaven just to get them back. Don't you think that a God that has eyes everywhere and a God that's got a hand that can reach down further than you can reach up and a God that's got a footstep and reaches the steps farther than you ever thought you could step, you think a God that big is going to let you go into this quagmire of sin and let you fall and let you fumble and let you flop out and forget you there? He will not abandon His people ever, ever, ever. Number two, He will not only not abandon His people. Number two, what else is our promise? Number two, the, faith, the fact that our faith has assured us. I want you to remember something that I tell you. In verse 14, he says this, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of them, thou hast also learned them. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know something. 
The faith that you and I have in the Word of God. It's not a faith that was concocted up last week or last month. This Bible was not written last year or the last century. The church that Jesus is building, the, this program that you're a part of called the Church of Jesus, it wasn't something that was concocted up in a man's mind in 1800s. This goes further back than the 1800s. It goes further back than the 1600s, the 1500s. It goes farther back than the 1200s and 1100s and the 10s and the thousands. It goes farther back than 900, 600. It goes all the way back to Pentecost. It goes all the way back to the upper room. This thing has got fathers. It's got the apostles. It's got the disciples. It's got the church fathers. You see the faith that has been given to you and handed down to you? It's not just some little pee-iny, puny faith. You know what this is? This is the faith of our fathers and the God that came through for our fathers. He is the same God that will come through for you and I. Let me give you this third one. I'm shutting my Bible. What is my confidence in this last day, preacher? Not only the fact the Lord will not abandon us, not only the fact that our faith has assured us, but number three, the fact that the Scriptures have armed us. Look in verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. That word furnished, it means to outfit has the idea of a soldier getting suited up for battle. He said, the Word of God that you've given, it's big enough, bad enough, great enough, and glorious enough to put you and take you through any situation that you handle or have. You say, preacher, my heart is cold. The Bible says the Word of God is fire that is shut up in my bones. You say, preacher, my heart is so hardened. The Bible says the Word of God is a hammer that can break in thousands of pieces the hard heart. You say, preacher, I don't know which way to go. I don't know which way to turn. The Bible says that it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'll hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You say, preacher, there's sin in my life and I don't know what to do. The Bible says that this book, it is a mirror and a laver. We can see into it and we can be clean through it. You say, preacher, I'm weak in my faith. The scripture says that this is the milk of the word of God. You say, preacher, I've got a loved one that's not saved. Aren't you glad this is a seed that can be planted on good soil? It is a seed that can be planted in the life of any man, woman, boy, or girl that will accept it by faith. You say, preacher, I've got a fight that I've got to fight. The Bible says that this is the sword of the Spirit, sharper than any other two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder the soul and spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, you say, there's bitterness in my life. The Scripture says this is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. You say, preacher, I can't handle it. I'm poor as Job's turkey. I don't have a dime to my name. The Bible says that this is purer than silver and more precious than gold. Ladies and gentlemen, you say, I'm being tossed. Oh, life, see, aren't you glad the Bible says that this book is an anchor to keep you from going from to to fro. You say, are we living in the last days? We are living in the last days. And at any moment, the Lord Jesus Christ will, couldn't come back. But until He does, child of God, take courage. He has not abandoned you. He has not thrown you aside. And you do have faith that will get you through the darkest night. And when you can't hold on to anything, you grab a hold of that old-fashioned black back Bible, hold it dear to your heart, and say, by the grace of God, I shall not be moved come hell, come high water. I've got a book. I've got an anchor. I've got a Bible. I've got a sword. I've got honey. I've got gold. I've got grace. I have the Word of God. I can face anything that comes my way even in these last days. I love the old Bible. That blessed old Bible. It makes me so happy, always so happy, as onward I go. You say, preacher, I'm scared. Fear not, my child, for I am with thee, whithersoever thou goest. We're living in the last days, pastor. We are. This very well could be the generation that sees the Lord Jesus come back. But don't be afraid. Do not fear. Do not hang your head, for our redemption draweth nigh. And all God's people said, Amen. Father, we love You tonight. Thank You for the Lord. Thank You for saving us. Thank You for calling us and keeping us and granting and giving to us grace and mercy, peace and help. 
And tonight, Lord, I ask You to encourage the people of God as we are in these last days. Not to fall down on the job, not to fall asleep at the wheel. And tonight, my Father, I pray that You would give to us the peace and power of God. And I know that the thought of living in the last days brings fear and dread into the hearts of many. And Lord, even into the hearts of Your people, there are some in here tonight that they're thinking about family, they're thinking about friends, they're thinking about a life that they want to live. Lord, I, I pray that tonight that the Word of God will encourage them and the Word of God will keep them and guide them. And then Lord, help us to be diligent in our labors for Thee. Help us to be diligent, Father, as we seek to win men and women to You. I thank You tonight for these fine people who make up this great church. I pray Your richest blessings both physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally upon them tonight. Draw us close to Thee and to Thy side. It's in the lovely name of Christ we ask it.